here tonight. Alicia's here and um, a few folks dialing in. Um, grateful to be together for our last um, and final installment of our, of our Psalms journey together for now. Um, but what I hope will be um, an opening for all of you to continue to explore Sefer Tehillim, to continue to explore the Book of Psalms and to find ways to engage with the Psalms and, um, as they appear in our liturgy and in our lives. Um, and, um, and always delighted to stay in conversation about Sefer Tehillim. And we are uh, together and folks are logging on. Um, I want to, to begin by um, chanting the words in Hebrew of the 23rd Psalm. We're going to look at the 23rd Psalm. Um, so I want to invite uh, folks, um, as you're able to, to mute yourselves, but to sing along with me from home, if you know this tune, to Sefer Tehillim to um, Psalm 23. I know that David uh, emailed out the source sheet. I just posted as well in the chat box, the source sheet, um, if folks want to find it there. Um, I'm going to open up with a little chanting of the, of the 23rd Psalm for us. Mizmor le David Adonai roi lo ersar Binot eshear vitseini Almei menuchot yenaleini Nafshi translation 
that for us is familiar in our, our culture in the, in the United States that comes from the King James Version uh, translation of the Bible from, from 1611. We're going to explore many other translations of the Psalms tonight, um, but also invite you to join along with this English if it comes to you, if it is familiar as I recite it. Psalm of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wanted to open with um, recitation of Psalm 23 again with what's perhaps the most well-known translation um, in English and one of the most beloved and well-known psalms from Sefer Tehillim. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us for our final class this summer about the Book of Psalms. My hope is that this class has given you some background about the origin of the Book of Psalms and the way this poetry sits at the heart of our liturgical lives. So over the past few weeks, we've looked at how the poetry of Psalms can serve as a well of inspiration and comfort as we navigate the ups and downs of being human. How Sefer Tehillim can provide a soundtrack for the oscillating narratives of our lives. Tonight, we're gonna to delve into the poetry and the theology of the 23rd Psalm, um, perhaps one of the most beloved and well-known sections of the Book of Psalms. With its central image of God as a shepherd, it offers a message of accompaniment, of presence, in the midst of pain and uncertainty. It's uh, woven with this comforting promise that God, like a shepherd, is there to attend to all the cares of, of God's sheep, of God's children, um, that God keeps track of us as a shepherd would uh, keep track of each, each sheep. As the biblical scholar Robert Alter writes, the psalm is famous for its affecting simplicity and concreteness with which it realizes this metaphor of God as shepherd, leading sheep to meadows where there's abundant grass and riverbanks and where quiet waters run that the sheep can drink. Rabbi Harold Kushner uh, wrote a whole book dedicated to lifting up the theology that, that can be found in this psalm, that comes out of this psalm, and um, according to, to Rabbi Kushner, the 23rd Psalm is a psalm of praise for the ability to feel safe in an unsafe world. And he speaks about the fact that God can't always protect us from suffering and from adversity. And yet within it, this, this psalm contains a promise that whatever happens in our lives, even as we deal with distress and despair, we will be seen and known and loved. God will not abandon us. Um, and I do want to lift up right in the whole emotional range and all of the layers of Sefer Tehillim, there are Psalms where, where we do feel that sense sometimes that God has abandoned us and the psalmist and the poet and we cry out, God, why have you abandoned us? Where are you? Right, so that is a, is a voice as well that we find in Sefer Tehillim. Um, and in the 23rd Psalm, we have this um, theological narrative that, that as we um, encounter, as we, as we face death, as we face uncertainty, as we cope with pain, that, that fundamentally we, we are not alone in that. Um, so I first learned this Psalm at Camp Ramah in the Poconos in the Hebrew, uh, when we would sing it, the, the tune that I shared earlier, in our session, we would sing it Sudash Lishit, the third meal of Shabbat. And it was a tender moment. The sun was setting outside of the Chadarofel, the dining hall. 
um, as we were preparing to part ways with Shabbat and we would sing this tune and um, at the end we would all chime in with a, a chorus of a refrain of ya da da ya da 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 ya da 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 ya da 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 and we would keep going on and on and you know repeating these ya da da's again and again until we were ready to to transition out of Shabbat. Um, I also have a very powerful memory of chanting this psalm on a Shabbat evening while walking across the Brooklyn Bridge uh, a summer evening in June. A number of years ago, I was participating in a walk um, called Out of the Darkness Overnight Walk, which um, was held and uh, by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, a walk in memory of those who have died by suicide and um, in honor of and holding survivors, right? Um, and with, with suicide and, and mental illness, there can be so much stigma and, and this feeling of isolation. And yet here we were thousands and thousands of people who had been touched by, by suicide and uh, walking together, uh, remembering our loved ones with names of loved ones on t-shirts and um, really lifting up these stories and, and this pain and yet feeling accompanied. And, and Yosef and I um, did this walk together in New York. And I remember as we were walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, really being struck by the verse in the Psalm, um, Gam ki elech begeit salma, but as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? We, we fear no harm, you are with us, um, even in this, this deepest pain, um, feeling a sense of, of being held. Um, and um, I shared earlier today the, the King James translation um, of this psalm, um, which often now, you know, for our local funeral homes uh, in, in Philadelphia, uh, the pamphlet is distributed and that's the translation that is, you know, is, is used. It has a familiarity to it. Um, and this psalm is invoked at funerals and, and also during Yisker service, during memorial services. Um, so um, I'm going to speak uh, a little more about the opening verses of the psalm and share some traditional commentary with you. And then we're going to break up into different groups to look at various translations of the psalm um, from Robert Alter, from the Jewish Publication Society. And we're going to listen for the ways that the psalm speaks to each of us, in particular in this moment that, that we're in, a time in um, many of our lives of, of great loss and grief um, and in our world of transition and uncertainty. Um, so we're gonna listen for how, how this song um, might resonate for, for us in these times or perhaps the pieces in it that, that might not resonate right now. We're gonna be in conversation with the psalm and I'm also gonna share with you uh, a very powerful um, rendition of the psalm, interpretation of the psalm um, from a member of, of a church in Austin who is sort of in dialogue with the verses, um, providing her own responses to the psalm as a practice you know, that, that we can use perhaps as we're engaging with this psalm or with any of the other poetry in Sefer Tehillim of our liturgy for inviting in our own voice into dialogue with the poet, with the psalmist, and ultimately right with, with God um, in this narrative. So, uh, I want to talk for, for a few moments about the first line of the psalm. Um, there is an um, incredible uh, commentary from Rashi, from uh, probably your most prolific Jewish commentator, medieval French commentator Rashi. Um, so the psalm begins with Mizmor le David, which is translated as a Psalm of David, or we'll see a David Psalm. Um, in the King James Version, it's kind of seen as a heading, this Mizmor le David part, but in the, the Tanakh, um, in our Jewish text and translations, um, it's part of the first verse of the Psalm. So Mizmor le David, a Psalm of David, or a David Psalm. So, so Rashi teaches, Rashi says, Amru rabotenu kol makom emar Mizmor le David, um, Right, so the rabbi said, whenever it says Mizmor um, le David, a song of David, um, this teaches us that um, 
David would play his musical instrument, uh, his lyre, and afterwards Shekhinah would come down upon him, right? So if, if there's this tradition of attributing the Psalms to, to King David, um, there's this beautiful understanding. Rashi is kind of engaging with the question and our rabbis that he's drawing on in the Midrash. How was David inspired to write these Psalms? Where did the Psalms come from? Um, so, so Rashi's understanding is in the Psalms where it says Mizmor le David, uh, there's this idea that David would sit down with his lyre and he would begin playing. And then Shekhinah, God's presence, would sort of come to him and inspire him. And out would come the psalm. Um, and um, that the song, as he played the song, it would bring this spirit um, upon David. Um, and we also have books in, the, in Sefer Tehillim that don't start Mizmor Le David, rather they start Le David Mizmor, which may be translated as of David, a song, right? And in those cases, we're told Shekhinah would come and rest on him first, right? Shekhinah would sort of come and inspire him and then out would pour the poetry, out would pour the, the song, out would pour the psalm. Um, so I thought that was, that was a powerful teaching for us too, as we're engaging with, with Sefer Tehillim. Sometimes in our lives, right, we, we, um, we're seeking inspiration and it's not coming, right? And maybe we use art, we use music, we use prayer, we start reciting psalms, wait, you know, in order to bring, bring that inspiration to us. And other times the inspiration comes and out kind of pours the creative offering. Um, so I thought that was a, a, a beautiful midrash that I wanted to share that Rashi teaches on this, you know, uh, 23rd Psalm. Um, and, um, and then Rashi continues, right? So the first verse of the, of uh, of the psalm continues, right? Adonai ro'i lo echsar, God is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, and Rashi says here on this verse, Rashi says, Bamidbar hazesha ani holechbo, batuach ani shelo echsar klum. In this desert, in this midbar, in this wilderness where I'm going, I am confident that I will lack nothing. Um, so he's sort of commenting on God is our shepherd and our shepherd for what, um, in, in what space, in what way, um, in the midbar. Here we are, all of us in this wilderness. And here we are, all of us in the wilderness. That we are seen and known. We are supported and loved and accompanied by God as we travel through, through the wilderness. Um, the Midrash, uh, on Midrash to Helim, also picks up on the narrative of Israel in the wilderness and um, you know, says that this psalm is describing God's chesed, God's unending loving kindness showered on the people of Israel as we uh, were in that paradigmatic time of vulnerability in, in the wilderness, that God gave us um, manna, that God led us to the waters of the well, that um, God gave us the clouds of glory, that God went before us by day in a pillar of cloud, that God was with us on that journey through the Midbar, was with our ancestors. And so too, for, for all of us and every generation, um, God continues to, to shepherd us through unknown uh, terrain and, and through adversity. Um, so I wanted to share a few of those traditional commentaries on the, the psalm. Um, I'd like to divide us up into groups uh, now into to breakout rooms to spend a little bit of time reflecting on the words of the psalm. Um, and then we'll come back together uh, as a larger group and we'll look at a few creative renditions of the psalm as well. Um, so in our Hebruta study, um, I'll, I'll put again in, in the chat box the, the PDF of the sources. David also sent them out to everybody who registered, so you should have them in your email as well if you want to pull them up that way. Um, but the questions I want to ask folks to engage with are, you know, what is the narrative arc of the psalm as you go through it? What story is the poet telling? And what shifts do you notice as the poem progresses. And all of these uh, questions are listed as well on the source sheet, so you don't have to memorize them. But, um, but yeah, so what, what emotional experiences are present in the poem? What's going on with the poet, with the speaker? And what's the, the narrative arc? What's the story that's being told? Um, 
all translation is an act of interpretation. And I offered a few translations and you'll notice some little bumps where the translations really diverge from one another. And I know some of us have more um, facility with Hebrew and familiarity with Hebrew. Um, and for, for those of us, um, you know, who are more comfortable in the English, I find this to be a really amazing way to study text. There are so many different translations of Tanakh and often we can pick up on like, where are the interesting interpretive issues by where English translations diverge from one another. So see if you can, can note, you know, in the six verses of the Psalm, where are those little hiccups and differences in the translation? And what is that, what, what are the differences in interpretation of what is happening in the Psalm? Um, and then again, inviting you to reflect personally on the Psalm, what resonates and what doesn't? What are you wrestling with in this text that doesn't speak to you? And what, what has spoken to you maybe at different times in your life as I shared a few um, stories of how I've encountered this Psalm, how it's been meaningful. Um, are there times also, you know, that you found it meaningful? Are there times when, when you found it challenging? Um, and finally, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the 23rd Psalm is traditionally recited at funerals during the Yisker memorial service and throughout Shabbat. Um, and why might we turn to the Psalm in, in these moments? So um, I'm going to... Um, pull in, um, uh, I'm going to pull one more time in the, in the chat box, just in case um, it didn't come through earlier for you, the sources. And um, so it's there in the chat box if you want to click on it and download it if you don't have them. And then we are going to head into breakout rooms for, let's see, it's 723. Um, we're going to go, go in, the, in the breakout rooms for, for 15 minutes, um, and I'll, I'll pop by uh, in your little uh, tables of our, of our Beit Midrash. <laughs> um, so thank you. David is going to help send us into these uh, rooms. Buckle our seatbelts. Okay, here we go. Um, so, Annie, I'm going to make you host so you can move from room to room. Fantastic. Thank you. If you'd make me co host, that would be great. Yep, I will do that. All righty. Uh... Okay, so folks who are still. It, seeing me, um, you should have something on your screen that gives you the option to join a room. Let's see. Let me see, yeah. So is it for you? Do you guys see an uh, option, a little uh, something pop up? Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I need to grab uh, a computer. Abe, Abe Trent does not have his microphone turned on um, or done his it. video. So it's just Jan Salas. And yeah. um, hi, Jan. I'll, I'll see if I can get her into her room. Okay, terrific. I'm going to just grab a computer charger and then <laughs> come right back. Okay, great. Okay, no, almost.
Yosef's still going up there. All right, let's go. <laughs> And and you, I can't um, end the rooms, the meeting. So you'll have to do that when the time. I will do that. Yeah, yeah. Whatever time I said, we went in the okay. seven twenty-three. I said fifteen minutes. Okay, I will do that. I'm gonna visit the rooms. Let's see. Oh, Abe seems to be on twice. He is in a room. Okay.
Hi, Gary. Welcome back. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, everybody. Welcome back. <laughs> How are your uh, sessions in the small groups? It looked like lively conversations when I they were. They were, were you able to peek into all of them? I peeked in. Yeah, yeah. So it, <laughs> you all seemed engaged in the text, which was uh, okay. Which was good. Okay. Um, Next time we better watch what we say. Then you can watch what you say. Yeah. Um, Something that I learned from um, some of you, from, from Phyllis and Ira, who mentioned that in school, when in public schools, that um, some of you, I see Lynn nodding her head, that had to recite this. The King James yeah. Version was familiar and Robin uh, yeah. um, from, from, uh, from childhood. Yes, we're um, showing our age. <laughs> yeah. I, I was like, in public school? One... And public school, that's not, that's not uh, religious school, that's, that's public school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a read Now Rena went Rena went to a uh, Hebrew school and I went to a public school so I memorized it. And she did. But uh -huh. the, right. the thing is when I st when I started to teach we had to read the Bible to begin the it advisory did. class. And I figured oh I'll start with Adam and Eve and I'll go through the thing. When mm -hmm. I got to all the he begat this and he laid down with her and I switched right to the Psalms and stayed there. Ah, <laughs> very nice. Um, yeah, so so in, you should have in, done the song of songs. <laughs> so in, in taking this time to to delve into a text, which maybe kind of becomes familiar and wrote, right? Um, it's an opportunity to to dig in a little more. What did you notice um, about the narrative arc or the the shifts emotionally throughout the poem, or what story is being told here? Did um, does anyone want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I will. Great, Robin. Uh, I I felt I found the opening to be very pastoral, uh, with a focus on this sheep, whether it's a real sheep or a metaphor of a sheep, or, um, and um, and kind of uh, peaceful, and everything is provided until the shadow of the death of death comes on the scene and then there's a real uh, turn. And um, we, in our group, we talked about how this being kind of the arc of, of life almost, or certainly the, uh, the consciousness of that death is always present. We may feel it closer or farther away, but we know that it, it comes to everyone. It's always there in some um, form or other or strength or other. And uh, I was. I also looked at it as a kind of uh, the arc of life. In other words, the the sheep is kind of a child, is um, you know innocent, and everything is provided for the child. And the wants are very limited. You know, it's water and food. Uh, I mean, certainly in this pastoral setting. And then um, there's a turn, not only because of the shadow of death, which is which comes. I mean, partly because we're we turn the page and there it is. I think it's even more shocking than we see in the whole um, text. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's evil uh, mm -hmm. and then there's enemies and, uh, and all of a sudden things become very dark. The mood changes. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anyway, so that, that was sort of the, now. and then it's resolved at the mm -hmm. end by uh, it's sort of with faith in God uh, goodness will and mercy will will follow me and and I making a commitment to God that I will dwell in the house of the Lord now that I don't know if that means I will have a long life or I will be faithful to um, to God's ways mm -hmm. for the rest of my life mm -hmm. thank you Gary let me unmute sorry um, I think the two points that I've and I've thought about this many times, or and, I, and it really shows up in the King James versus the Alter translation, 
is this for now in our lives or is this forever, whatever mm -hmm. that means? And is it justice that we're looking for or holiness? And uh -huh. I've always thought justice and in our lives, but maybe I'm just not the theological enough. But I think that's a huge difference. And if you look at the different translations, um, they're, pr they're both pretty accurate translations of the Hebrew. It's not mm -hmm. like you're going very far to get the difference. So that's all I have to say about it. And my Hebrew might not be good, but the rest of it, I think, makes sense. Yes, no, beautiful, right. So those are some of the interesting interpretive decisions, right, of Magle Tzedek. What, what are those? Is it paths of righteousness, paths of justice, or is that an ethical um, sense of, of a world of justice, or is it a different um, sense of a life, you know, um, in covenant with God, right? So that, yeah, those are definitely interpretive differences. And, and thank you for lifting up that theological question of, is it, is it forever? Is it beyond time or is it in this world? And I think a lot of the um, Jewish uh, commentators, Le'orech Yamim is really referring to um, this world. And I did, you know, in some of the other classes, we've been looked at a contemporary translation by Richard Levy. I didn't bring his translation here, but, but I did appreciate for that verse, he says for days, long, long days, yes, uh, yes. something like that. He, you know, so I think it's really focused on this world. And I think for um, some of the Christian translations, it is uh, about the, the world beyond. Um, and even in later on in the source pack and and if we have time, maybe I'll show you this uh, musical rendition by Bobby McFerrin. It was a contemporary musical um, uh, improvisational, I mean, just unbelievable composer, musician. But that has, you know, the translation has a whole sort of uh, added, um, uh, almost theological, like, coda <laughs> at the end, which is really looking at, you know, the world beyond. Um, and whereas I think a lot of the the rabbis and, and Jewish commentators are focusing on, you know, um, on this world and what life looks like in, in this world. Um, um, Ira? Uh, Annie, if, if you'll let me, I just want to jump to your last question that you posed. Yeah. You discussed it earlier about, well, we recite this at funerals and uh, Yisker mm -hmm. and so forth. Oh, and that's true. And we're, we're used to the King James translation. Mm -hmm. But at funerals, the rabbis are always reciting other Tehillim as they're escorting the uh, casket out of the chapel. And for very religious people, they hire the uh, rabbi or, or student to, re to recite Tehillim all through like the night before a burial, okay? Mm -hmm. For those for who sure. aren't buried that same day. So mm -hmm. which of the Tehillim are the ones that you are reciting? And would any of them be a better choice than the 23rd Psalm. Uh-huh. Right. No, I think that's a good, a good um, question. I know it's Psalm 91, right? But, right, they're all, all different to Helen, but a lot of them do sort of talk about uh, a trust in God or a sense of, you know, accompaniment or protection, but the, or, or longing, you know, the, some of the Psalms for a house of mourning. I'm thinking of like Psalm 42, um, has lines of sort of crying out and to God and um, in longing, in despair, you know, in, in that sense of of, um, of grief. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. But so, but so, why do you think what what about this psalm? And for folks, do you find it comforting or or not? You know, I leave that open as well. I'm curious to hear more from you. What was your your response, your heart, okay. you know, <laughs> response in in reading it? Well, I think I. Can I go on? Can you hear me? Yes, Elkin. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So we're, we're talking about two things, basically, that it's a song to comfort the living, the survivors, mm -hmm. because it's um, the, the guy, the, the deceased is gone, but the, the survivors, the loved ones, mm -hmm. friends need comforting. And this psalm says to them, at least the first part, that you're still part of the flock. God is still the shepherd, the big shepherd, and you're still part of the flock. Hmm. I, may have, I, have, I may have sent my, my colleague to get you, maybe wandering off somewhere, 
So my dog, if I can't find you, my dog will find you. We'll be back in the, be back for dinner tonight. Um, the other thing I noticed is that if you go, first of all, first of for me is that it's only six verses. I was sure it was much longer. <laughs> it's only uh -huh. six, six verses. I thought it was, I thought it was like, yeah. 10, you know, oh, look at it. Wait, I missed something. Wait, 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 I missed something. Okay. Uh -huh. And then the other part is I think that the suspense of Tanya, you know, you, you go to verse five and it says, uh, you spread the table in front of me in full view of my enemies or opponents. And I said, wait a minute, this has to be Psalm 23b. You're talking about the deceased and, and, and the survivors, and then you run off the enemies. I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. You'll change your mind? Okay. I changed my mind too. I well, think this is, a, this, is a, this is a living poem. Yeah. Or the living, and it is, uh -huh. and it is a uh, poem about uh, somebody who has enemies and he is, uh, uh, and if he stays within uh, God's realm of the living, mm -hmm. he will be taken care of. So there's no death in this. The only death is, yeah. well, mm -hmm. there is some death in the future and so forth, and I just have to keep going along with what. Uh, God wants of me and I will be taken care of huh. all the days of my life. So it's days, not, day. not the post death. Mm -hmm. That it's yeah. about life. It's about yeah. what happens in, yeah. in meeting adversity, confronting death, surviving yeah. um, and, and carrying on through that. Um, yes. I thought Dina agreed that it's about life. Alicia said it's powerful for just six verses. Yeah. Right? It lacks a lot of uh, punch in six verses. Um, <laughs> So, if I may, I, I don't yes. have my name. It's Caroline Gordon. I'm visiting Hi. with you. Wonderful. Hi there. And so I, I was just going to um, comment on the first part of the psalm. It seems to me this is the person speaking to oneself. Mm -hmm. One's own thoughts. This is talking about God as he. Mm -hmm. That's speaking yeah. to God. And One's inner voice saying what God has done for oneself. And then it transfers from the last line, and you, your rod, I feel because you were with me. That's what he feels. And then it feels, and then it goes on to, now you, now talking to God. Mm -hmm. So now you spread a table. So we have the two parts, the, the one that is um, introspective, personal, mm -hmm. your own thoughts about oneself. And then it goes from that part outside of oneself to engage God in this come in this psalm for what you are doing. So I find that very powerful to have the two parts of um, oneself, um, the inner and the outer involved mm -hmm. in this this psalm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for characterizing it in that way. Right. And there's that that shift. Yeah. Um, yes. From being in third person into to second person to this direct conversation um, with God. Thank you, Caroline. Joseph. Oh, Joseph, you're muted. Um, there you go. Oh, hang on one second. Joseph, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Got okay. you. Mm -hmm. it, it begins with. Um, repose and still waters. We had a discussion of what that meant. I thought that it meant, you know, you have to have that at the beginning of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, it, but it was, um, it, you have to have some foundation at the beginning of your life in order to go through the, the challenges of life. But um, uh, Phyllis Fisher pointed out that uh, somehow it, as you go through the challenges, and she talked about, for example, people who were in the Holocaust, this feeling of, comfort, I don't know if comfort is the right word, but of, of peace, somehow people have still experienced it. So uh, the question is where that comes from. I don't, we, that's something mm. we discussed. Mm. Mm. Thank you for, right, for naming that and uh, where that image, um, or where that, where that one emotional experience is the feeling of peace and calm in it, and um, uh, and yeah. having it in the in the in the thick of um, 
adversity or challenge, being somehow able to tap into that sense of being held and comforted, um, even in, in a time of struggle. Um, I mm -hmm. wanted to lift up for you. So Harold Kushner, um, he, he breaks it down into three acts, right? He says, um, we can read the 23rd Psalm as a drama in three acts. Act one is serene, pastoral. Um, the psalmist feels safe and secure, and he thanks God, his faithful shepherd, for providing him with that security. Act two turns dark and stormy. The psalmist's life is interrupted by trauma, tragedy, and bereavement. Instead of dwelling in green pastures by still waters, he finds himself alone in a dark valley. Then he learns he is not really alone. He comes to see God not only as the source of the good things in his life, but as the source of comfort and consolation in hard times. He comes to understand that only because God was with him uh, was he able to find his way out of the darkness. He learns, as all of us who have gone through hard times, learn that the sunshine we step into when we have found our way through the valley of the shadow is infinitely sweeter than the sunshine we had basked in during our carefree, cloudless days. In Act 3, he realizes that his understanding of God, his relationship to God, has matured as well. God is no longer just the one who follows him through his travails. God now offers him something more permanent, an invitation to dwell in his house. Um, and, you know, I know I heard a number of you in your groups as well were commenting on what is home. You know, what does this mean to dwell in God's house? Um, and Kushner says, right, home is a very evocative word. And, and Robert, he quotes Robert Frost, who defines it as something you somehow don't have to deserve. Um, the ultimate expression of the promise, I will be with you. Home symbolizes safety, security, a refuge from the dangers of the world outside. And honoring that, you know, as, as I think Joseph mentioned as well, not everybody has that, you know, experience as a, mm -hmm. as a child or, or you know. Um, and yet, like, what does that mean then, even if, if humans aren't able to give that to us, that there is a God that um, uh, desires that, you know, for, for us. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to lift up. I thought I really liked his art, you know, breaking it down into the three acts. Um, is that Susan? Yeah. Yeah, but th there's a gentleman who I don't know, Abe Trenk, who's been raising his hand. <laughs> so oh, yes, yes, good news. Thank you for yeah. thank you for I've telling me. Yeah. Yes, Abe, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, it was just that the comment that Robert Walter said mm -hmm. that uh, he doesn't like soul. He substitutes. Uh, you know, yeah. concrete things, which some uh, one of the women said before, because the concept of the afterlife was not there mm -hmm. when the psalm was written. Yeah. So he translated, uh, you know, all the days of my life uh -huh. uh, without the uh, implication that, uh, that, that there's an afterlife. Yes, beautiful, right, that it's for the here and now, the days of our lives here in, in this world, not this like forever beyond. Um, yeah. Yes, and um, even some of the differences which are interesting, right, nafshi is shovev, my nefesh is is revived or restored, um, That whether that's soul or my life, because in Hebrew it really refers to like a life uh, force, even a, a physical life, and whether that, um, so yeah, some of those, those, differences in the, in the translation um, are fascinating. Yeah, Gary. I have a question which I've never really understood is, is the I, thou change from you to some outside source? Isn't it from you to you? I mean, we're going back in the philosophy here with the I, thou thing, but, mm -hmm. but I always got the feeling that you find it inside yourself. That's mm -hmm. why Mm -hmm. um, I think Joe mentioned, you know, people in the camps use this to, to resolve their feelings before they died. And, and you're looking inside yourself, not outside yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And, th and that question of wh where does that happen, that, that relationship um, with the divine? And is it, an, um, or, or where do we find that sort of courage? Um, to continue through things and maybe it does it come internal um and external or 
somehow like woven into our um, our being. I'm I'm curious what people would say. This this image of um, the table with the, the nourishment or whatever it is that the person needs um, mm -hmm. in full view of my enemies mm -hmm. is what kind of a, I mean, I have my own take, but how does that strike you or how does that strike people in this context? You know, um, I'm just curious. It's a, it's, Mm -hmm. Right. Well, no, and I, I think Walter kind of points out it's in a, there's a cluster of things described sort of a sensual, physical pleasures of life, yeah. Yeah. Um, physical elements of a happy life, a table laid out with good things to eat, a head of hair, well rubbed with olive oil. And his interpretation that is that it's not actually about, because there's some mention, right, of anointing with oil in a ritual sense. And his is that it was more about, you know, a physical, sensual pleasure of having one's hair rubbed with oil, a cup of overflowing wine that um, it's, it's a sense of enjoying, you know, being able to, to be in the moment and finding. Well, there's sort of like a, like in the face of my enemies, it's like, you know, thumbing your nose up. That, that's what I was seeing here. Interesting. And I was just curious, is that just me or? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, the, the yeah. phrase is, living well is the best revenge. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great, that's it. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so, so thank you to all of you for your in wonderful commentaries. And um, I um, oh, wow. I'm happy to stay, stay with everybody. Uh, for, for a few more minutes, because I do want to show you one one um, video, and I'm also mindful that I know there's so much, it's just so rich um, to talk about this psalm. Um, um, but just want to offer, if anyone who hasn't yet shared a comment would like to say something. I see also in the chat box, Beth, thank you. Uh, I once heard a beautiful interpretation that we're in the valley the entirety of our lives, um, and God's presence is the constant. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, any other, other folks want to share something, a reaction to the, to the Psalm response mm. to the, this particular Psalm or any of the, the, the comments that have come up? When I wrote my Haggadah many years ago, uh, there was a wonderful Yiddish passage about how I'm not, I'm not educated, but I know God will give me a table with, with, Mm. He built the fish and wine and uses the imagery of the 23rd Psalm as a reflection of what the Passover Seder is. Oh, gorgeous. Mm. Very nice. It I was love written that. Somewhere around the First World War in Yiddish, but huh. of course, I don't speak Yiddish, so I got to translate into English. That's really <laughs> powerful. That's really powerful. And, um, you know, I think one of the other things that's interesting, too, in terms of the table, in terms of some of the imagery, um, going back to the Midrash I shared at the beginning from Midrash to Hilim that picks up on the narrative of the Israelites in the wilderness and God's chesed to them, um, there's also this sense that um, how does God restore our souls? And, you know, that it's a metaphor for Torah um, in a way that um, that. Uh, based on, there's another verse in Psalms, right, in Psalm 19 that says, the Torah of Adonai is Tamima is perfect, and Meshivat Nafesh restores the soul. It has like an echo of the language of, of um, the restoring the soul here. And so the rabbis say that's, you know, how our soul is res restored um, through, through Torah. So maybe if God doesn't come to us directly, um, we have God's Torah, and, and within the Torah, um, as I like to say, we have, uh, you know, balms for, for the spirit. We had to have a medicine chest of, of wisdom and of things that can support us and bring us comfort um, in, this, in this journey. Um, Sue? No. Oh, there's another, Sue, Sue Hankin? Yeah. Oh. Did you want to speak? Or I'm just going to try, unmute. Okay. Um, I have a question about what a... What does it mean? He makes me lie down 
in green pastures. Ha we were just started to talk about that in our group and we didn't really get to it. But I've often wondered, how does God make us lie down in green pastures? I mean, uh, the next, he, he leads us, he restores, but how does he make us lie down? Yeah, and I think that it's interesting that English there is sort of the, the verb form in Hebrew, like when our beats, like to cause to lie down. Yeah, and yeah. It, apparently it's, it's a word that's used when it comes to animals. You know, again, with that metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep, that somehow the shepherd, you know, uh, right, but that's a good question. How does, what is God's role in sort of causing us to, to find, if lying down in the green pastures is like being able to find that respite and find that, you know, repose in, in the midst of what's happening um, that we're struggling with. Um, but that's a good, right, in the English, it kind of raises that question of what do you mean, right? Yeah. Um, Alicia? Yeah. I remember from uh, teaching a long time ago that under that idea of um, pastoral and uh, animals and guiding that apparently sheep can only lie down if it's very, very calm and rested. So maybe ah. that calmness forces, not force, like Thank you know, you. a gun to your head, but it, it's the cause that allows them to lie down as opposed to a force that makes them lie down. But that, I, I can't remember, it was a long time ago, but I think that's what, how they resolved it. Huh, beautiful, right, that, I love that. Um, kind of gives that precondition that, that right, um, what, what is needed in order to be able to huh, let go, exhale, right, relax. Um, what is the foundation um, that's needed for that to happen? Um, and sometimes it's hard to find that, you know, within ourselves, I know. In these times too, it's hard, you know, in times of great um, anxiety and uncertainty to just even have the permission to like, you know, breath, let go, rest, really, you know, enter into Shabbat, um, thinking about yeah. using the Psalm as well on Shabbat. And, yes. and I think a piece of it is that it does point to that, those moments mm -hmm. of menucha that are sustaining. Um, so, um, um, I want to share with you a, um, a powerful video of, um, this is Samantha Beach Kiley, who's at a, a church in Austin, who engaged with a psalm, I think this psalm in a very creative way, sort of offering her own responses, inserting her voice um, in, in dialogue with the verses of the psalm. So I'm going to play this video. There's background music, but it's more visual, so I'm going to share my screen and um and play it for you um and again i know um i'm happy to to stick around and continue i also understand if folks have to log off because i know we did say we were going to end at eight so i'm going to play this video um and then we'll offer if, if folks have any any reaction and then um send send everybody off with um with blessings um so here um let me this on um, and see if I can make it bigger for you.
Oh, is that beautiful? Oh, yeah. oh brilliant. I'm going to go like, I'm not even playing with you. I won't even like I'm it. I'm so ugly. That's the way we feel. <laughs> oh, is that wonderful? Could you repeat her name? I assume yeah. it's is it a YouTube thing. So it's, I, um, it's, it was on Facebook. Uh, a friend had shared it from their church website. Her name is Samantha Beach Kylie. And I can, um, Share the link. Share the link with you. Um, I, 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 there are one or two people who I have to send it to. I just love it. Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's just um, perfect. And I think it's just a powerful way of oh. engaging with the Psalms, right? Of really being in conversation, of oh, reading after each line. You know what's coming up, and just I oh. think that the book Sefer Tehillim. What do you think has been so powerful about it through the ages across traditions? is that it really invites our hearts and our lives and our experiences into dialogue with the poet who is um, speaking from, from the depths. And so I um, want to, you know, encourage and, and invite all of you as well, you know, to, as, as you continue to engage with um, the book of, of Psalms. Oh, Robin, you found it. In Here, the, thank one you, Robin. Uh, thank you. Um, that um, I hope that that um, as we you know we're concluding this formal uh, study of of Sefer Tehillim together, that you will continue to engage with the Psalms and to bring bring your heart and your soul and your doubt and your questions and your joy and your gratitude and your longing um, uh, to to these ancient words of, of poetry. This was an amazing class. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. Yeah. yeah thank you. What, was the last name? what was her last name again? Thank you. Of the, of the, um, that was Samantha Beach Kylie from the New Austin Church. Okay. Um, thank you. And feel free if you'd like to stay in conversation about any of these topics, anything that's come up in the class. Um, you can follow up with me, Rabbi Lewis, at bzbi.org. Um, and I hope we'll have many opportunities to continue to study Torah together, that the Torah and these, uh, this, this poetry of Tehillim will, will be um, restorative for, for our souls. And wishing all of you, you know, this uh, summer, um, may, may you find some, some restorative time and may we all, right, be, have the ability to lie down, to have those moments of, of peace, to be able to exhale and let go and, and feel held and seen and known in the midst of um, these uncertain times that we're living in. So, and yeah, I hope you can teach. Mm -hmm. teach. Really thank you. I really look forward to learning with all of you. Thank you for the gift of your Torah and insights and, and coming you. together in our virtual Beit Midrash. Um, what, a, what a gift to be with all of you. Um, so I will, um, we have uh, at 8.30, 
um, Marev Minion here on this website. I'm going to play, if folks feel like sticking around, I am going to play one other video. This is Bobby McFerrin's version. Oh, I'd love that. If yeah. you'd like to hear it, I'm going to play it now uh, for anyone who would like to as our, as our conclusion. So I'm going to pop that video up. Let's do it, okay? Hmm? Let's do it. Get this screen. Um, screen share going again. A good teacher. Okay. Is everybody mute, please. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Annie. For you, think um, again. I just wanted to, to share that other uh, powerful <laughs> composition, right, Under with a different theological coda. So um, but, uh, yeah. You really so, have changed the way I think about what I eat. Best book I've seen on diet ever. If um, you've been struggling with your weight, I've got the solution for you. The people at home right now are saying, I cannot believe what I'm doing. There you go. 